Tom Levecki here with the latest edition of the Arm Chair NBA. I'm your host, Tom Levecki, and I got a very special guest today, one of which, if you asked either of us a year ago, would we be on the same podcast, but we are. Lisa Babic, she is, she runs the Button Guys New York Mafia.com website. She has Mob Fireside Chat, which is an excellent YouTube channel. Um, I'm going to put a link below, and she's also an established author uh, of Guilt for the Guiltless. Lisa Babic, welcome to the Armchair MBA. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, Tom. Thank you for having me. It's easier to get the president on a podcast, but Lisa and I finally uh, got together, <laughs> and we're going to talk about uh, primarily the Bobby Manor trial, amongst other things. Uh, I know we did a show earlier, but Lisa, I would consider the subject matter expert. So Lisa, why don't you give a little background and context on the Bobby Mana case from the beginning and then kind of where we are now. Well, in 1988, he was arrested. Bobby Mana, Richard DeCicio, Martin Casella, and some others were arrested on a RICO conspiracy charge. And that included the murder of Irwin Schiff, a um, conspiracy to murder John Gotti, gambling charge, and then, you know, other kinds of RICO charges. Okay. So he was convicted in 1989 and sentenced to 80 years in prison. Wow. But he denies or, you know, he's innocent or he claims innocence on the Irwin Schiff murder and also with the gambling charge. And there are a couple of things in regards to that as well that shows that he, that the charge is questionable. I'm um, definitely with the Irwin Schiff murder. It's questionable. I mean, it's, I would say more likely than not that he is not guilty of that. All of those three guys. Okay. Um, so really, so really, really, really quickly, six, I want to uh, unpack it a little bit. Um, what was, the alleged or, or evidence they used on the sh Let, let's focus on mana specifically and shift murder. What was used there and how strong or weak was that particular evidence? The evidence that was used against him was basically tapes. So they had recorded conversations in the Casella's restaurant in Hoboken. I think it was. Yes. And it was Martin Casella who was uh tape that said, Oh, well, you know, Bobby killed him. I can't give you the exact, I don't know the exact yeah. verbiage, but it was discussed that they were responsible for Schiff's murder because Schiff what, had some construction company or whatever it was, and they thought he was skimming money, you know, whatever, that's what the government said. But yeah. as it turns out, those tapes, I mean, there's evidence to show that Casella, Martin Casella was never in the restaurant at the time those alleged tapes were um, done you know, that they oh, were wow. recorded. Yeah. Oh, wow. That, that's good. <laughs> wow. Okay, and and so, there's, I mean, there's yeah. FBI surveillance logs showing that Casella had left the restaurant at the time that he supposedly was having this conversation about Irwin Schiff. Got it. Okay. So, so circumstantial at best. Right. Okay. So then, um, okay. So circumstantial evidence there for the Schiff. Um, how about the, uh, the Gotti conspiracy? That's not even an issue. I mean that I'm not gonna, you know, discuss that the main point of contention is the gambling charge and the shift murder. Those are the two things Got it. that he's been fighting since his conviction and claiming innocence, Got you know, it. in addition to him trying to, you know, get compassionate release cause he's 92 years old. Correct. I want to get to that. So obviously, you know, um, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know this. Stuff. That's why I'm asking. And, and I know you have a journalistic background. Um, your understanding, if he just got the one charge and not the other two, would that most likely be less than an 80 year sentence? I'm guessing it would. But what is your understanding as a journalist studying this? I'm not really sure about that. I just know that they gave him the 80 years, but the reason that he couldn't get parole is because there was like a parole law established in 1984. And so any chart, any um, crimes that he may have committed prior to a certain date, he would be eligible for parole. And if anything happened after that date, then he's not eligible for parole. And that's where the gambling charge falls under it came after or those crimes came after alleged crimes came after 
that time period, whatever it was, it was something like 1987. So he missed parole, being eligible for, for parole by seven months. And uh, they call that a predicate. Is that a predicate act when you do something before that kind of builds into something else? Is that what it's called? Or is that, is that called yeah. something else? Yeah, I think that that's what a predicate act when they do the, um, you know, indictments, you know, they could go back for a certain amount of time or whatever and include all of that into an indictment. I haven't Got seen it. a copy of his indictment. I'm trying to get a copy of it so I have a clearer idea of exactly what he, he was charged with, you know, all the details rather than just relying on newspaper reports and that kind of thing. Got it. All right. Um, with that being said, though, um, and let's give a little background on Bobby Mana without, you know, obviously when, um, you know, he's an alleged member of organized crime, an alleged member um, um, of the Genovese family. But again, being a part of any type of um, brotherhood, whether it be, you know, mafia, allegedly, or, you know, Freemasons, that's allowed. That's not illegal. But what's tricky about this particular case, it was also fought in the media. Um, didn't, like, when he was going to the courthouse, didn't they have, like, marshals? With, right? Like, wasn't there, like, a little bit of, like, Hollywood nonsense going on around this case that could have potentially influenced jurors, in your opinion? Yes, most definitely. Um, if they're the most famous picture that you see of him is when he's coming out of the courthouse and he's in shackles, you know, chains around his uh, waist and chains on his ankles, chains around his wrists, and then behind him you see the guy with the rifle. You know, it's a U.S. Marshal holding the rifle. So, you know, even though it was an anonymous jury and I think they were sequestered, you know that people are going to be looking at stuff or they're going to see something or come across it. And so that helps build this dangerous person type of persona that the government is trying to get across. And then you also see him with um, going through, you know, going to the paddy wagon, paddy wagon. You see DeCicio going to the paddy wagon. So there are a lot of these images that are put out into the public that don't paint a good light on them or a fair light on them. And it's something that I think the government does use. And I'll give you an example of something else if you'd like. Please. Um, in my story at, on Button Guys, well, part of it is up there, but the story I had done previously on the Cherry Hill Gambinos, when John and Joe Gambino had in July of the year of their trial, right before their second trial, they had taken off to Florida. You know, they escaped because they were offered or, you know, because the judge gave them, you know, took off their ankle bracelets or whatever. And then they took off to Florida and they were supposed to go to Venezuela. But the cops had caught them. You know, they started surveilling them. And so when they were in Florida in their hotel room at night, and there was a lot of like foreign travelers at this hotel, yeah. they went and they took all of, they asked all of these people to get out of their rooms because they had something to do. And yeah. so here are two guys, they're in their room in the middle of the night and they barge in there with, you know, whatever they barge into rooms with after they knocked on the door. So they made this huge thing out of this. And then, you know, they caught them in, they were in their underwear is what, you know, was printed. They didn't put up a fight. They didn't put up anything, but they made this huge thing when all they could have done, they could have arrested them at any point, but they I wanted to that. create, right. They wanted to create this huge movie production. And then when the newspapers interviewed some of the people at the hotel later, there were little boys, you know, saying, oh, I was watching out the window. It's just like the movies and this and that, the other thing. So they create this atmosphere to make these guys look like super dangerous and then when they actually went to court for their trial i think they had like 14 armed u.s marshals going along i mean here's a guy i think john gambino was like in his 50s or late 40s or something like that and he walked with a cane because he had had strokes and heart attacks so what is he going to do they're all in chains you know both of them are in chains but they had to have 14 armed guards following them you know it's just a little over okay. the top i want to get to the compassion at least but before we do tell us about the decessio situation as well uh richard, richard right if i'm saying it right richard decessio decessio and um give us that your little background and context and then we'll kind of move forward to the pack compassion release well decessio was charged with being um like the strong arm guy for the 
for the Genovese family. Okay. And he also, he was involved in that gambling thing. But with the Schiff murder, he was accused of being the guy in the hallway while the Schiff murder was taking place. So there was the guy who killed him, whoever it was, and then this witness, her name was Vivian Lewis, and she had seen this guy at the end of the hallway by an exit door in the restaurant in a dim light who had a hood on, and she later identified him as Richard DeCiccio. Interesting. But her testimony, her testimony had changed numerous times. First, it was a guy with the hood, and he had slick black hair, and then it was this... Um, athletic looking guy and he was a tough looking guy very well built and then what the government did was they took um her to a courtroom where he was going he was in for something and yeah. so they put her on a bench and then asked her if this is the guy that she saw and she said yes and you know so it was just a lot of um things that I don't know. I, I want to say shady, but you, I don't want to use that word, but just things that are questionable. Got it. Yeah, because a lot of the, the fighting is done outside the court, not inside right. the court. And by then, prejudice can set in. OK, so we'll move forward. So they get they get you know large sentences. Now, kind of fast forward to present day, walk us through the, you know, the Bob. You know, and I, I always thought the first step back or other other um, acts um, would help people like this elderly committed a crime, probably model model prisoners, as I understand. So give us kind of like the, the, I guess, the evolution of uh, his attempt for release and what happened with Bobby Manna specifically. He had tried for compassionate release in 2020, and he was denied. Okay. Then he tried again um, this year, and he was denied again. And his lawyer had cited a few cases of other people who were similar in charges and length of sentence and medical conditions so and so forth that were granted compassionate release. But what happened is, of course, the judge denied him both times. And in this last one, in their denial, they didn't even mention any of the people that Mana had mentioned in his motion for compassionate release. And they always fall back on the same thing. Well, yeah, he's 92 years old. Yeah, he is a, has all these medical conditions that are bad and fall within that first step act. But the point is, is that he is still a member or alleged member of organized crime and he still poses a danger to the community. So we can't release him at 92. Right, exactly. And same and the same with DeCiccio. I mean, you know, they haven't he hasn't ruled on him yet, but I'm sure that it's not going to be in his favor. You know, they they're supposed to rule on law and precedent and, and they always use the word discretion. And what discretion is is just your personal feelings. You know what I mean? Because if you're ruling on law and precedent, then you're going to look at a guy who in in the examples that they cited that has all of these similar charges and convictions and whatever and you're going to say okay well if we can release him then we should be able to release them if you remove the organized crime label would it be different you know yeah i would um i am not a defense attorney and by also by doing this um the strategy what i'm about to say probably would make it worse but what what if let's say you are convicted member of organized crime right and you are away for 30 years right um or longer even right and you have all these organized crime experts right you know that i know that they bring in the organized crime expert to say you can't do a hit without a ministry you know you know, you know the whole deal right right so i would bring an organized crime expert for the defense who would come in and say listen or it, god forbid an informant and say listen if you're away for 30 years and you're 92, you're put on the shelf, you're, 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 you're stripped of your administration title or whatever the legend were, and to give context that like, if you're away that long, right, and, 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 and 92 years old, like, I think it cuts both ways, right? Like if like an informant or um, uh, an expert, let's go with an expert, not an informant, let's say an expert, wouldn't an expert said, you know what, that's reasonable that Bobby Mann is no longer in the administration, it's reasonable 
that he's not in a position of power, and then he comes out in 92, he's essentially shelved. Would that argument resonate with the judge, or that actually is admitting that he w was a member? Because I was just wondering if that, because the, the government uses that same angle to put people away, right? right? Why can't that same angle be used to release him? What do you think of that? Well, first of all, the they would never allow the defense to bring an expert like that in because that's just not something they would do. Okay. I mean, they deny experts all the time for the defense. But in this case, the government itself conceded that MANA is unlikely to recidivate, whatever, not to do crimes anymore. Recidivism, right. Yeah. yeah. And um, they also said that he is sick. But then they said because of the egregious crimes of his past, that should, you know, just forget about it. He can't come out. So they can't even look past anything that he may or may have not done, including the shift murder, which he probably didn't do. And they just won't, they won't give these guys a break because you have to think about this too. If they release one of these guys, let's say they decide, okay, we're going to let DeCicio go because he's the lesser, you know, danger than, than Mana. Yeah. But if they release him, then it's going to open the floodgates for a whole bunch of other organized crime guys, which also isn't fair either. Because why are you doing that? You can't just group these people together. You need to Correct. just group them with everybody else. You know, there can't Correct. be rules for one group of people and another set of rules for another group of people. That's correct. And then, you know, one thing that's I'm passionate about is not that I'm like pro organized crime in any way, but, you know, I kind of feel and there's ample evidence to support this, that the RICO Act and certain predicates are slanted towards Italian Americans. There was a FBI agent, you'll probably know if you can elaborate, that actually came out and said, when you put an Italian name out there and you put the mafia out there, you get more budget, you get more resources, you get more man manpower, and it's like almost a feather in your cap and fast track to getting promoted. I don't know what was that guy. What was that FBI? His guy's name, name? His he was uh, he was an FBI. His name was Justin Dentino, and he was like head of the New Jersey. SCI, okay. um, State Commission of Investigation. And okay. then he also was on Ronald Reagan's Organized Crime Task Force. And he's the one who said that. And if you go on my Instagram, um, it's, well, you could put a link on there, but it's the underscore New York Mafia with underscores in between. And there, yeah. it's, it's, I listed on there, but he said this at a conference in 1984, I think, or 1986. And he talked about how there were like 15 union racketeering cases. And when they submitted them to Justice Department, they only approved two of them because they were involved with Italian organized crime. And he had said that, you know, that they're obsessed with Cosa Nostra over everything else. And they won't even look at Russian organized crime or anything like that. Do you, do you think that the disproportionate effort against Italian organized crime may have allowed other gangs to flourish, like an MS-13, like Latin Kings, uh, maybe other organized crime groups, in your opinion, are maybe flourishing because of the, you know, the marketing behind going after La Cosa Nostra? Well, I mean, I'm not an expert in that, so I can't really say, but... Yeah. If you think about it, I mean, it could be, you know, why aren't they going after or spending as much effort going after all of these people? And granted, you know, they removed some of their resources against organized crime after 9-11 to focus more on terrorism, but they still make Italian organized crime a priority. I mean, how many times do you read about some Russian organized crime getting busted or Correct. even, you know, MS-13 or any of these people? You never read about that because it doesn't sell newspapers. Agreed. Now, um, I am in touch with relatives of Bobby Mana. I can't obviously disclose who they are. Um, they are they most likely not going to be able to come on the show, but this is going to be an ongoing piece, Lisa, where I may actually... Um, hit you up again uh, and 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 help me with it because I think this is a passion of yours. Um, so why don't you give us present day right now? You know, is man, man exhausted? Is he kind of done in terms of you know uh, appeals? Where is he at? And where is the CEO at before we you know before we wrap up? 
Well, um, I that would be great. I am working on a larger investigative piece on that, which we'll be posting up on our website um, very in the very near future. Awesome. But as far but as far as Mana is concerned. I think that he probably does have other options. I mean, it isn't like everything is ever exhausted. But this guy has been fighting for 33 years that he's been in prison, his innocence for the Schiff murder. So, I mean, it, you have to think about this. If this yeah. guy even thought for one minute that he was guilty of anything, why is he fighting for so long? Why is he trying to get FOIA documents, going through all of the process, paying all of this money to do all of this? And it's not easy. There's a lot of red tape to go through any sort of appeal process and all of these steps that you have that you have to take in order to get to different points. You know, it's ridiculous, actually, for any person that is jailed trying to fight their case. You know, there's a lot of red tape, a lot of just outrageous things that people have to do. So he always will have an option, and I think he does have other options, whether what they do, I mean, I, I'm not privy to that. DeCicio hasn't been ruled yet regarding his latest compassionate release request so that the judge had said that it's going to come in a couple of weeks so you know probably after christmas i would imagine interesting and i'm going to say and i'm going to yeah. say it's probably going to be no that's my feeling i listened to the hearing you know you could pick up sometimes what how the judge is gonna rule just based on you know their demeanor even though it was a telephone hearing same judge yes Okay. That's the other thing. I think judges in this country have a lot of power. Especially oh, federal definitely. Judges, especially federal judges, people have to really understand. Like, they are magistrates. It's, like, a big deal. And they control your life. And if you're in that situation, the close rate, I think, among the Eastern District is, like, 96%. I think the, the, the Southern is in 94%. So if you get a federal case against you, um, it, you have to do a deal. You don't, you don't have a choice. Um, right. And, you know, the BOP, too, is... It's kind of weird how everything has to go through the BOP, you know, to exhaust your administrative remedies. Yeah. Because the BOP isn't even, there's no oversight on it. It's like its own little Correct. country, you know, Correct. which is kind Correct. of, shouldn't be that way either. I don't even understand that. Agreed. And, um, you know, this is something that we're going to keep following. Um, Lisa, you've been great. Um, again, we this is more of a quicker one. We wanted to kind of, Get the story out there. I am in touch with the Manor family. Lisa and I are constantly in touch. She's always breaking my chops over correcting me <laughs> on mob stuff, but that's why she's here. And uh, Lisa, again, we're going to do a plug for uh, the Button Guys, NewYorkMafia.com, and also check out Mob Fireside Chat. So we're going to wrap it up. I'll give you the final remarks, Lisa. Uh, what do you, what say you? Um, well, come and watch my channel and definitely go visit the NewYorkMafia.com. Um, but also people need to keep an open mind about certain things and not just judge based on what a person may or may not be. And that's the case with Bobby Manna. You need to take a step back at what he may or may not have been and look at him as an individual or any of these guys, you know, DeCicio or whoever it might be to, you know, see if what it is that's happening to them is actually something that would happen to somebody without that label. And it doesn't make you make me pro- organized crime or pro anything just because I'm taking a different stance on it. Agreed. And thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Don't forget to like subscribe and share. We're getting closer to 10,000, a whole bunch of, uh, um, awards to be given away. And Lisa, thank you for being on the armchair NBA. Thank you, Tom.